So first of all, I, I'm, I'm Stefan Erickson from LASP. Um, Tom Woods apologizes he can't be here today. Uh, he fell ill on Friday and I couldn't quite make it. But I would like to introduce today's speaker. Jack Gosling has been a leader in solar and space physics for the last 50 years. Uh, he received his PhD in physics from the University of California, Berkeley in 1965. So 50 years this year. He spent most of his career at the Los Alamos National Laboratory in New Mexico. And we have been very fortunate to have uh, Jack here at the last, for uh, the last 10 years. So he has been recognized with many awards for his outstanding research, including the AGU John uh, Adam Fleming Medal and fellows in the AAAS and AGU. He has also been cited by six different journal editors for his excellence in refereeing. He has worked with plasma and magnetic field data from more than a dozen different satellites over the years. And he will be talking today about some of this research concerning CMEs and flares. The solar flare myth was published in JGR in 1993. It explains the relationships and importance of flares and CMEs. Jack will now enlighten us about this rich history of flare and CME observations. Jack. Well, I'd like to uh, thank the organizers for inviting me to uh, talk at this meeting. And uh, I was urged to talk about Skylab and some of the early observations of CMEs, and also about the paper that I wrote on the solar flare myth. It's been more, more than 40 years since I was involved in Skylab and since I've been involved in anything with chronographs. It's been more than 20 years since I wrote the paper on the solar flare myth, and I have not talked about it, written anything about it in the years since. So in preparing for this talk, I had to almost start from scratch. Not only are all these slides taken from old papers, because I didn't have modern slides, uh, but they're all old. Skylab was launched in May 14, 1973. It was eventually occupied by three different crews. Its main purpose was for NASA to demonstrate how uh, mankind could operate in space. Uh, this was launched on the declining phase of the solar cycle, close to solar minimums, for very little solar activity was expected. Uh, it was launched in an orbit about 50 degrees inclination to the equator, uh, and it was at a height of 435 uh, kilometers. Three Skylab crews. Remember, the launch was May 14, and uh, let's see, does this thing work? No. Works better when I point it the right way. <coughs> Uh, the first crew was launched 11 days after the uh, Skylab itself was launched. Uh, and they stayed up there for 28 days. And they operated out of the Skylab. And they used the telescopes that were on board. The second crew came up about a month after the end of the first one. And they stayed for almost 60 days. Then the third crew came up in November 1973. And they stayed for 84 days. There were a total 171 days when the astronauts were there and they were operating the Skylab instruments. Uh, but we could operate a lot of the instruments without the astronauts being there. 
So the total operation time was like 251 days. Uh, the chronograph, which is what I'm going to talk about, operated for 227 days. Now, here is a picture of the Skylab in orbit. And the Apollo telescope mount is right here. That carried a bank of eight telescopes. Those telescopes were each about three meters in length. And the ATM uh, canister, if you will call it, was three meters, and it was a diameter of about two meters. Now, this was not launched in this position. It was launched down in line with the rest of the Skylab. But it was rotated after launch 90 degrees, and then the solar panels were unfurled. And they provided 2,000 watts of power to these eight magnificent telescopes for that time of, uh, in our lives. If you look closely here, there's something that looks like a gold foil. Well, that is a gold foil. During the launch of Skylab, a meteoroid shield which provided thermal protection from the sun for the main operating part of the Skylab was torn off. Further, these solar cells here failed to deploy, but they opened up only part way down and in here. And in the 11 days prior to the launch of the second crew, they had to plan to how they were going to try to fix this and operate it. They inserted this gold foil here, which used as a temperature control, and they managed to get the uh, panel out here to provide power to the spacecraft. Now, most of the uh, telescopes could be operated from the ground when the astronauts were asleep or when the astronauts were not there. All but one of these telescopes used film. And at that time, that was thought, oh, that was good. Because the OSOs, for example, had digital data coming back, and they couldn't get nearly the resolution that you could get out of film uh, in those days. The, uh, see, I think that, that was all I wanted to say, other than those cameras were big, and the operation of those cameras, getting them off the telescope and back on, was a major part of what the astronauts did during their extra vehicle activities. Now, at this time, I was on the HAO staff, and this shows the staff at 1971 alongside the chronograph. And this picture was taken in a clean room at the end of a tunnel that was about 100 feet long, and it was placed about where the basketball stadium is now at the University of Colorado. No longer exists. Uh, this had three external coating discs. It was the follow-on from a series of balloon flights that were in, uh, led by Gordon Newkirk and some of his students. One of his students was Jack Eddy, who stands right here. Uh, the other people in here are Dean Keyes, who was one of our engineers. That happens to be me, Jack Eddy. This is Bob McQueen who became the PI on this experiment when Gordon became the director of HAO. This is Charlie Ross. He was a project manager. He's the only guy that really made this whole thing go. He was interacting with NASA as a lone person, really, with some support from Dean for the whole thing. This is Art Poland, who joined our team in about 1970, I think it was. Now, if you look carefully here, you'll see a camera here. On that camera is a, are the letters S052, which was the name of this particular experiment. Now that camera held rolls of film that were uh, 750 uh, feet uh, long. So a lot of pictures would be taken. But the point I want to ask, oh, and the other thing is the resolution of this telescope was about a 20 arc second, but it varied across the field of view. Uh, let's see, if anything else I wanted to say about that? Uh oh, in the band pass, it was white light. It was 37 axioms to 7,000 axioms. Now, if you stand at the back of this instrument, then you look up here. This is the front of the instrument, and it looks down the tunnel. 
Now on this next slide, this came from a file that I had. This next slide shows what it looks like in Eddie's Skylab book. And you'll notice this one is on the right-hand side, the camera, and this one is on the left-hand side of the, of the. <clears throat> Now, which of those pictures is correct, I'm not quite sure, except I can read the SO52 on this. And at this image we were we, uh, reversed, I don't think I would be able to see that. Anyway, I think it was right-handed. But again, now this camera and the film in it were my prime responsibilities. Exactly. When I was on the Skylab team. Hey, Jeff? Yes. It's on the right because it's about the third one. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Uh, I was on this, I joined the team in 1967. The concept for Skylab, I think, started in 1964. Gordon Newkirk and Jack Eddy proposed that particular instrument. I joined the team in 1967, and Jack Eddy dropped out to do boring things like this stuff, covering the Monder minimum and things like that. Uh, <clears throat> well, main thing I had was film. I, so when I came on, I started testing different films that we might use at the back of the experiment. What I found out, there was no existing film that had the combination of sensitivity and resolution that we could have put at the back of that telescope. As a result, we contacted the people at Eastman Kodak. I made several, several trips to Rochester, and they developed a new film that had sufficient sensitivity for us to use in the telescope and sufficient resolution, the 20 arc second resolution that we had. Again, they produced this in 750 foot rolls that we use in those big cameras. By the way, the instrument was built of Ball Brothers, including those cameras. Uh, we also, I was also re responsible for processing the film. We did that at Aerospace out in California because they had developed techniques for processing long rolls of film very precisely to get a gamma of one. And they wanted to say, so we would go out there every month or two to check on their uh, progress and making that happen. I was responsible for calibrating the film. I had to load, unload, and transport these cameras. Now, Ball Brothers was very smart. These cameras, they were designed to be carried in a case that would only fit under the seat of a first class room, a seat <laughs> in the airplane. So I had to carry these things out to California. I had to carry them down to the Cape. I had to go to Houston. I had to go to Houston for this. I took lots and lots of first class trips uh, with these cameras. Uh, I was also responsible for loading and unloading them in complete darkness. And the cameras were rather, had a rather complex uh, mechanism. I'm not quite sure at the time why it was quite as complex as it was. But it jammed halfway through the first mission. We could tell the film was not advancing. And so for the next, uh, oh, by, by the way, it jammed right after our observation of first CME, which I'll, I'll show you in a second. Uh, and that really worried me because we had never tested these things in zero G. And I thought, oh my god, maybe this is because we never tested these things in zero G, and we're going to have problems with the other cameras too. What well, works out, we didn't have any other problems with any of the other cameras. Uh, I was also involved in developing the jo joint observing programs, designing it, and then implementing it down in Houston. Down in Houston, we did daily planning of these jobs. The jobs are how you, the astronauts would coordinate the observations and the telescopes and acted as a part-time czar. The czar was the only one in the ATM group that was allowed to be in direct contact with mission operations, uh, where the astronauts actually talked with the CAC comment there. Uh, finally, I was supposed to do some science with this uh, at the end. But I left a year and a half after splashdown and only wrote three papers uh, using the Skylab data. And I was co-author 
and four or five others. Uh, now, the next few slides are going to be a little bit of history prior to Skylab. There had been ideas about ejections from the sun and causing disturbances at Earth uh, that stretch back to the early days in the 20th century. But Parker, when he developed his model of the solar wind, he found out that when he did this, that he, when the coronal temperature was higher, he would get a faster speed. And so his idea was that when you have a flare, you heat the corona, the wind goes out faster and creates a blast wave that runs out in front. And these are just different pictures of it based on different models, but the blast wave itself was this. But these, in this model, you didn't add new, any new magnetic flux to the solar wind because you were just expanding the solar wind and the magnetic, um, magnetic field lines that were already open to the heliosphere. Uh, there was a, a counter idea going out is that no, all these things would come, what, what happened when you had disturbances in the solar wind is it would come from closed field regions on the sun and they'd pull up additional magnetic field out into interplanetary space. Everybody agreed that if that was, that if they did come from closed field regions, that they would bring additional magnetic flux closed field lines out in the solar wind. Now here's a paper written by Hundhausen in 1970, where he made estimates of the energy that would be released in a big, from the sun in a big solar wind disturbance, and how much mass would be thrown out into the solar wind in association with that disturbance. And he did this by essentially integrating the excess that you have above the ambient when the disturbance comes by. This disturbance fronted by a shock that has kind of come here. And then there's an enhanced energy flux here. Here's the density as a function of time. Enhanced mass was coming out. And this is coming at a slightly slower speed. Now, he did this for a number of different events, integrating how much was there that wouldn't have been there had there not been a disturbance. And the numbers he came up with were 10 to the 15, 10 to the 16 grams, and energies ranging between about 10 to 31 and 10 to 32 ergs. This was three years before Skylab. Another paper that came out in the same time frame by Joan Hirschberg et al., again using Vela data, much spottier, of course, than modern data, but she found out this velocity, magnetic field strength, and the alpha to proton ratio. Now, the alpha to proton ratio is typically of the order of about 4% in the solar wind, but it's time variable. But what Joan found is when you had times when the alpha to proton ratio got greater than about 10%, that virtually all of those were occurring after interplanetary shocks. So a conclusion from this was that the plasma driving shock disturbances out is often helium rich, and it's different from the normal solar wind. Uh, this was taken from a paper that Hundhausen wrote in 1972, and it drew on those previous bo bottle models what uh, Tommy Gold and others had done. He put in a rotating sun, he even had a flare in here, and it's important to emphasize in this time, just about everybody was thinking of flares as the cause of the disturbances that you see in interplanetary space. The things that Art added to this was he showed the draping of the magnetic field around the ejection. He had some question marks here as to whether the event would ever disconnect itself from the sun. Uh, and that was very much in my own mind because I was working with Art uh, prior to this time and very familiar with his work. Here was a paper that uh, Vic Pizel and I did. It was published the same month as the launch of uh, Skylab. And it shows a plot, scatter plot, of proton temperature against solar wind speed. And it shows the general correlation that as you go to higher and higher speeds, you get faster and faster, I mean higher and higher temperatures. But we also found out that if you look behind shocks, you often found anomalously low temperatures. Anomalously low 
for these velocities. And so plasma driving shocks often has anomalously low proton temperatures. Now again, in these days, we were thinking that all disturbances coming out from the sun would be causing shocks. It works out that's not true. A number of these other points that aren't circled here are probably CMEs that weren't going fast enough to drive shocks. Well, back to Skylab. This was right before the camera jam. We had, this was taken in an unintended mode. In other words, we were controlling it from the ground. And so the orientation of the pylon here, which was holding the disk, remained the same. And so we were able to make a movie of this thing propagating out through here. Now the camera jammed right after this thing got out of the field of view. <clears throat> and up to that time, we had not seen anything uh, on our film. And I was watching it as it came out of the processing. And this was at the very end of what came out. Now this shows the characteristic form that CMA had. They had this loop-like structure, <clears throat> which indicated that these were probably closed field lines. This particular event was going about 500 kilometers per second. A detailed paper on this uh, was uh, written by uh, Ernie Hildner. Uh, oh, another important thing about this that I want to emphasize is this was associated with an eruptive prominence on the limb. There was no flare and associated with, it, with the expulsion of this, these loops like this, but there was soft x-ray event that occurred after the event lifted off. That becomes important in terms of things that are going on after uh, CMEs are released from the sun. Now, this was the first uh, paper we were talked in any detail about uh, a number of these events. I was happen to, happen to be the first author on this one. These are the times of the observations. And you can see a brightening here, and it grows bigger at this time. By this time, you can clearly see the loops coming out, magnetic loops. That loop-like structure was characteristic of all the Skylab uh, CMEs to a greater or lesser extent. Another thing you could see in here, if you look carefully, is this ray here is curved away from the CME as the CME is coming out. That told us that there was a bow wave running out in front of these things. We couldn't resolve the bow wave, but we could see its effect on surrounding solar wind structures. This particular event uh, was associated with about four times 10 to the 15 grams and had energy associated with of about 10 to the 31 ergs. Now, if you look at the acceleration profile for that last event, you find out that low in the atmosphere, it was only going about 150 kilometers per second and accelerated out to about 450 kilometers per second. And that was characteristic of CMEs that were associated with eruptive prominences. The few that had very strong association with flares tended to be faster and tended to come out at a more constant speed. Uh, Overall, where we could make measurements of the uh, speeds of the CMEs, the leading edges of speeds, they range from speeds less than 100 kilometers per second up to 1,200 kilometers per second. And of course, now we know they can go in the exceed of 2,000, 2,500 kilometers per second when you get a very energetic event. The most probable speed was very similar to the most probable speed in the solar wind itself. This line here is the uh, escape velocity from the sun at six solar radii above the sun. Now, Skylab observed this was near solar minimum about one CME every five days. Uh, and I think that number is fairly comparable uh, to uh, present numbers that people get. At solar max, of course, you get many, many more events. This was a picture taken from Jack Eddy's book, and it shows a eruptive prominence and it shows also a chronograph here. This is a CME. You have a very hard time seeing it in this particular thing. But this illustrated, again, the common association that we observed, eruptive prominences and loop-like CMEs coming out from the sun. 
Well, some of the results that came out of Skylab. One, the transient mass ejections from the sun are common, even at solar minimum. They arise from closed field regions in the corona. Typical ejection was like 4 times 10 to 15 grams and 5 times 10 to 31 ergs. The displacement of the ambient structures indicate that the bow waves run out ahead of the CMEs. The CMEs exhibit a wide range of outward speeds. We were able to show that a sufficiently fast CME actually produced a solar wind shockwave disturbance. We had one such event like that. And we observed that outward moving magnetic loops in the field of view of the chronograph, which went from two solar radii to six solar radii from sun center. They never went back to the sun. They always kept going away. Now, there are a few surprises for Some people like me, for example, I was familiar with that picture that Art Hunnass had drawn. I was familiar with some of the earlier stuff that had come out. And so I wasn't really all that surprised that we would see these loop like structures associated with them. By the way, Osho couldn't resolve the loop. Uh, they had seen some of these events prior. But there were many more CMEs that we observed than we expected to observe based on major solar wind disturbances that we're seeing, or major geomagnetic storms, or forest decreases of geomagnetic activity. We were seeing many, many more events than could be explained, that we expected, I guess, on the basis of those other things. The CMEs were more commonly associated with rapid prominences than with the pulsive solar flares. That was certainly a surprise. Magnetic disconnection from the sun was not directly observed by the chronograph. We never saw one of these things that appeared to pinch off within the field of view of the chronograph. Now, you can see that in CMEs that have been taken with other instruments, but with Skylab, we couldn't observe that. Many CMEs were followed by gradual soft X-ray flares. And those often had the form of newly formed coronal loops. Now, that's evidence that you have reconnection going on behind these things, uh, even though we couldn't detect the CMEs themselves uh, in our images, that the CMEs disconnected. Now, uh, uh, That's supposed to be a movie. <laughs> I guess that's not going to work as a movie. But the point I wanted to make on this is you can do much better with chronographs flown since then than we were able to. This was a one, hour, uh, one month movie showing many, many scenes. And the field of view of this is 15 solar radii. And so you can do a much better job with modern instrumentation we could ever do with Skylab. Uh, you can, in addition to this, you can see like the movies that uh, Greg DeForest showed uh, of hemispheric imagers. There's much better ED uh, imaging where you can see things going on close to the surface. There's just techniques that have been developed since then. You're doing digital data rather than film. You can do image subtraction and so forth. And you can do much better than that what you could do back in the Skylab days. But that's things that happened afterwards. Uh, here are some subsequent results. I'm just going to talk about a couple things afterwards. This was taken by from papers written by Harrison, but the drawing is by Hundahl. So I think it was published about 1986. And they did a very careful examination of the timing between when impulsive flares occurred and when CMEs began to lift off. What they found out was that CMEs began to lift off before any significant flaring activity occurred. They also found that the flare sites tended to be at one side of the coronal loops that were being ejected from the sun. <clears throat> this is taken from a paper by Hundhausen, and it shows up here the latitude position of active regions on the sun. This shows flare latitudes on the sun. During the same interval when SMM was operating, 
the latitudes at which you observe CME. Uh, and you can see that the latitudinal distribution here is considerably different. It works out that CMEs tend to be organized relative to the heliospheric current sheet, or the geomagnetic equator, whereas active regions and flares are organized by solar latitude. So this was a very strong indication that CMEs are not fundamentally a flare-related phenomenon, although they can occur together and often do. This is work done on solar wind electron distributions at one AU. Now, if you take a cut, a 1D cut, to an electron distribution at one AU in the solar wind, you find there's a thermal core and there's an extended tail. Now, this extended tail is, is essentially collisionless. If you try to calculate the temperature for this, you find that it has a temperature like a million degrees, which is like the coronal temperature. Uh, but it's much, much hotter then is the thermal population, which has a temperature of about 13 eV. However, you can't fully appreciate the superthermal electrons unless you look at their pitch angle distributions, that they're usually strongly uh, beamed either parallel or anti-parallel magnetic field, always in the direction out from the sun. And that beam is the result of conservation of magnetic moment as the electrons come out uh, from the sun, they focus down to the field, and that is balanced somewhat by scattering uh, as they come out from the sun. But you can use this fact to learn things about the topology of objects in the solar wind, including CMEs. CMEs, since they're basically closed field structures coming out, they have a heat flux coming out on each direction along the loop, so that when your CME comes by as a closed loop, you can see this straw going in opposite directions along the magnetic field. Whereas in the normal solar wind, the straw is unidirectional, just goes outward from the sun in one direction. So this is a very good indication that the CMEs at 1 AU are primarily closed field region objects. That's not entirely Entirely the case, you have reconnection going on behind these. You can get open field lights in CMEs. But that's a common signature of most CMEs in solar wind at 1AU. So that's one good tool for identifying CMEs in the solar wind. There's a bunch of ways by which you can identify CMEs in the solar wind. I already mentioned helium abundance enhancements. Already in here, you can see one in, in this particular CME. By the way, this is showing pitch angle distribution, superthermal electrons, proton density, proton temperature, proton speed, the helium abundance relative to hydrogen, magnetic field strength, and the field strength angles. <clears throat> you can see that there's high helium abundance in here. It's not greater than 10% in this case, but it's still pretty large. You can see that it has a very low temperature compared to what it had at that same speed previously and following. <clears throat> you can see these counter-streaming beams of electrons here. This is what the normal solar wind looks like. This is what a CME usually looks like. You have beams going both ways along the interplanetary field. You can also see that it has a very strong magnetic field, and that magnetic field is rotating as you go through it. That's a characteristic signature of a flux rope in the solar wind. <clears throat> now, if you look here closely, you'll see that at, at the start of what we identify as the CME. By the way, this CME was driving a shock it's here. You can see that by the discontinuous changes, density, temperature, speed, magnetic field strength that occur there. And it occurs about 12 hours after uh, the CME occurs about 12 hours after that shock. But during the start of this event, the field was not only strong, but it was strongly southward. And if you look at magnetic activity, geomagnetic activity associated with this particular event, you find out that there's a moderate geomagnetic storm going on during this interval, and then it tails off during this interval here. This sort of thing led us to do statistical studies 
between CME-driven disturbances and geomagnetic storms. This plot on the right now shows a distribution of all values of Kp, which is a geomagnetic index of activity, versus what, what Kp is here. And we arbitrarily, in making this figure, drew lines here. Anything above here was a major storm. Anyway, here was a large storm. And here was a medium storm, or a moderate storm. These were small storms. And this, we just didn't label at all. But anyway, we wanted to concentrate on these values of Kp. What was in the solar wind at those times when those geomagnetic indices were observed? During this four-year interval, which was at solar maximum, 13 out of the 14 storms occurred when you had both shocks and CMEs coming by. The other one, there was a shock that came by, but no CME. As we looked at these large storms here, there are more of them, 23, but all but one of these events were associated with CMEs and shocks, or CMEs alone, or shocks alone. Only one of these didn't. And as you go down to lower levels of geomagnetic activity, smaller storms, you find that fewer and fewer of the events are associated with CMEs and shocks, but they're associated with high-speed streams and things like that. <clears throat> The, uh, oh, when you look at the speed distribution of CMEs coming out from the sun, you find out that a very large fraction of them are just riding along with the solar wind. These are slow ones. And only about one out of six CMEs gives you a large or major uh, storm. Now, if you look at the first 24 hours, after the passage of a shock, and you bend the things according to those storm categories, this is a little hard to read, but this is the distribution of all solar wind speeds during this four-year interval. This is, a, this is the distribution of speeds when no storm was going on. But as you got to other storms, large storms and major storms, these all migrated to higher and higher speeds. So you, the fastest CMEs are the ones that tend to give you the biggest storm. And there's a relationship between that speed and the magnitude of the storm. If you look at the distribution of magnetic field strengths during uh, these storms, again, this line here is the distribution of all field strengths. This is when no storms are occurring. And then, again, you can see as you get to large and major storms, you get stronger and stronger fields. So fast CMEs with strong magnetic fields are the ones that tend to give you the largest storms. And that's not too surprising that they go together. Uh, when you have high speed, you get compression of the magnetic field. Finally, if you look at the southward component, and this looks a little different. But you can think you can see here that there's a tail here for these major storms. They tend to have southward fields. Now, when you look at, you can also see positive fields here. And that's because a lot of times you're in a sheath behind the CME. And the field can be either northward or can be southward. But there's a very strong tendency to have very strong southward fields after these events. Well, switching to another topic, studies were being done of association between CMEs and energetic particle events. They were called solar energetic particle events. And I think they still are called solar energetic particle events. There's a category that's called three helium rich events. These tend to be impulsive events where they rise on times of an hour and decay on times of hours. They're associated with impulsive electron events, and there's thousands of those types of events that you can observe during solar maximum. There's another class of events, which were what were called major particle events here. These are events that lasted for several days at a time. The integrated flux you get out of them uh, is much greater than the integrated flux that you get out of these types of events. Latitude distribution of these events 
concentrated on the Western Hemisphere. And that's where you expect to have good connection back to the sun from where this disturbance occurs. These major particle events, however, came from any longitude. That's because they're driven by CMEs that are producing shocks. And those shocks propagate out along large fraction of field lines that are coming out in that hemisphere. <clears throat> so this is another indication that CMEs are very important for space weather type events. Well, I'm at the point where I'm going to talk about the essence of what the solar flare myth is. Simply, the essence of this, what I call the solar flare myth, or called it 22 years ago, is that solar flares are the prime cause of major space weather events. That had been around, I think, ever since George Ellery Hale, and possibly earlier, that idea. And it's still held by some people. They think that solar flares are the major cause of major space weather events. By that, I mean large geomagnetic storms, big shock disturbances, Forbes decreases, uh, cosmic ray intensity, and so forth. Well, if ever, the actuality is that coronal mass ejections are the prime cause of major space weather events. And there's very little evidence that solar flares produce CME. Now, CMEs and flares often do occur together. And that's because they're both due to the complex magnetic field and rapid evolution of the magnetic field. But you get CMEs and you get flares, but the flares don't cause the CMEs. They're all separately. They're both separately caused by a common mechanism, which most people think is reconnection. Well. Why did I write the myth paper? I've sort of told you why I wrote it. Uh, some people encourage me not to write it. Uh, the first was, by, by, by the way, by this time, we were 20 years after Skylab. We not only had the Skylab observations, we had SMM observations, we had the NRL uh, chronograph, uh, I can't remember that mission. Yeah, OK. Uh, and we had done a lot of uh, work with 1AU data. Uh, but at the AGU meeting, I sat on the uh, executive console of the SPA thing, and a de demonstration was made. Uh, not a demonstration, but a presentation was made of an NSF-funded exhibit that was aimed for the National Air and Space Museum. And it was t entirely about flares and how they called major events in near Earth space. That, post, that presentation did not make a single mention of a CME. And when I said something about that afterwards at that meeting, the other people sitting around the table said, Jack, what are you talking about? Only Nancy Crooker said, yeah, Jack's right. <clears throat> Another thing that happened at that AGU meeting was Lockheed Markin put out a poster based on Yoko. And the big story there was, oh, it was a big flare that caused the Quebec power outage, I think it was in March 1989. Big mention about flares, how important they were, not a single mention of CMEs for causing these disturbances. Those are the two of the big things that inspired me to write that paper. The third one was there was a general neglect of an ignorance about CMEs and their causal role in large space weather events. And this is very, very surprising. We've known about these CMEs, we've known about their effect in planetary space for 20 years, and yet people were still talking about solar flares as a cause of these things. Well, is the problem ended? Well, no. Just a few days ago, I looked on a Discovery News channel, and they talked about a huge solar flare reveals explosive magnetic fritter. Uh, the main part of that thing was to talk about the x-rays that came out and the fact that you had a perturbation in the ionosphere. They went on to mention, however, that in addition to the solar flare and consequent radio blackout, 
the flaring region also created a coronal mass ejection. Magnetized blah, 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 blah. Now, this isn't too bad because as they say the region, but when you read that, it sounds like the fair is the one that, that caused it. And this sort of thing is still going on. And either a lot of us who've been thinking that the CMEs are the fundamental thing, either we're wrong, or those people shouldn't be saying that flares are what cause interplanetary space. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you.